thanks for coming, Pablo. So this is Pablo. He's going to be talking today about Gaussian processes, which we which we're very excited about. Um, Pablo has been at the University of Madrid. I met him once at the University of Sheffield, where he was there for a, a brief period of time working with Mauricio. Um, but now he's uh, at DTU. Thanks, Alan. Okay, um, thanks for the presentation and also thanks for, for the invitation for this talk. Um, I'm super excited to, to really come here to Second Mind to talk about these things uh, that I like. Um, my background is more of on engineering and for many reasons I end up with Gaussian processes. So I'm really, really happy to, to talk about these uh, intuitions or ideas that we have been exploring uh, since a few years now. Uh, that is this thing of model recycling, like uh, reusing uh, Gaussian process models. So let's see if you find this interesting. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, first, uh, just to motivate as a motivation, I, I want to present what is what I consider is the general machine learning pipeline uh, that we have observed uh, so far. No? So uh, the, the learning process uh, consists of three steps. No? Okay, we have a very well defined first step. That's step one, that is around the data. No? Okay, we, we collect the data, we observe the data, we have a database, uh, data set. Okay, we, we know how is our data, the structure, the nature. And uh, given the data, we choose to, to do a task. Uh, we can choose to do representation learning. Maybe we want something more generative, uh, something uh, latent variable model, uh, nonlinear regression, for example. And based on those decisions and knowing our data, we, we do a model definition. No? Well, can be a latent variable model, whatever, but being a probabilistic model, we define some parameter with, uh, sorry, a model with some parameters that we want to learn. And our third, our third step will be to, to, to train this model, to feed it, uh, learning parameters, performing inference. In the end, we finish uh, these three-step uh, task with a model that is trained. I mean, we all, all practitioners in machine learning, we, we know what it is this. And, and once we have this model trained, we use it for prediction, imputation, or other final task. Let's, uh, let's talk about this, about data-driven models, no? So let's... Uh, right now, uh, this this has been the the, the the workflow so far. No, but with also uh, also from US, particularly um, there is an interest now with these new foundation models or in, uh, immense models with so uh, with millions of parameters and really 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 difficult to train. Uh, there is becoming more important this this idea of okay having pre-trained models, no? I mean, somehow this, this general machine learning workflow is changing because, okay, uh, now that training a model requires, training these foundation models requires so much time, so much resources, that new um, ways are appearing, particularly this idea of the pre-trained model. We, you, you, you do a, a first task with some data to pre-train models. And from that, depending on your final task, you use extra data to get your model finally fitted, no? Um, okay, so somehow everything is now going uh, to a direction where it might be interesting to consider this new pipeline that uh, I would like to call this recyclable machine learning. Um, that also consists on, on this idea of not revisiting the data anymore, no? It's like kind of... Once we have a model uh, that is fitted, we save it, okay? Uh, maybe it's easier to, to, to save these models instead of the data for privacy, preserving reasons for uh, distributing uh, options, whatever industrial uh, problem or task that we consider. So this, I, I would like to, to introduce to you the, this high level idea of a model driven uh, of model-driven models, no? where we, in our step one, what we have instead of data is a dictionary of models 
that has been already fitted to some data for some task in a very general way. And from that dictionary, we built and defined a new meta model that indeed is a model. And we are able to fit a new model, not using the data, but using uh, fitted models uh, instead. And in the end, performing a task or again, saving this. So why recycling? No, why, why, why is this idea interesting? Um, let's think, uh, let's motivate well, one last time uh, before we go into the Gaussian process details. No? Um, the, the, the funny thing, or at least what I observed uh, at the very beginning when I began to, to think about, uh, to got interested in, into this problem, is that particularly in probabilistic learning, um, the computational cost is always dominated by the number, uh, by the number of observations. I mean, this seems very obvious, uh, but okay. Um, in this, we we kind of have assumed that these data-driven models is the is the thing that we have to do, and there is nothing else. Um, but if we consider really these model-driven models and we take apart the data, in this computational cost dominated from the observations, from the number of observations, changed a lot. So I, I, I really want you kind of uh, dreaming with this. Now with this thing, okay, we really uh, have some data for every different set of data. We have a model, any model, at, uh, any model that we are of interest, and somehow, by some mechanism, we are able to obtain new models by combinations of the others. In some way, adding us uh, this, this property of modularity, okay? So cheaper computational cost, and also this, um, yeah, um, much more uh, modular task, or uh, is indeed is a new framework. At least is what what I see here, no, and and what I wanted to to talk about. And in the end, what 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 I would like to propose is this thing of having a dictionary of fitted models. That this indeed is happening already. I mean, um, this is what I wanted to introduce before with these new foundation models and these new apparition or these new interest in pre-training models that are appearing in the repositories with already fitted models. So this is kind of what we maybe have to, to think in the future, a dictionary of fitted models for later building uh, new ones no? from that. Okay. Um, of course, <laughs> in Gaussian process, this, this dependence uh, on the number of observations is, is, is very obvious and very well known. And, and, and this idea uh, from a long time ago and, and in probabilistic machine learning has been of interest, uh, particularly on distributing on parallelizing uh, uh, GP learning. Uh, I wanted to remark uh, these two papers of Mar Eisenroth, which is kind of nice, uh, distributed Gaussian processes, but this, that one is mainly a focus on regression. You, you, you perform regression on distributed subsets, and later you are able to predict by combining the predictive, uh, the yeah, the predictive posterior uh, from every local model, and also uh, I think that Jaringal a few years ago did this also this super nice paper distributed uh, variational inference with Asparagus in processes, which is more on distributing the the computational cost, more the the. Uh, that way, that is was kind of a first attempt to this federated learning, this thing of distributing uh, the computational the computational cost uh, across nodes, and later having a a, a central node that really uh, performs the prediction. So, kind of these two reference uh, uh, really inspire me for 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 this thing that I'm gonna tell now. Okay, so my goal now is gonna be. To, to present to you uh, how to build a principle framework to build models from models using Gaussian processes and surprisingly in a, in a reliable way with, with good results. So let's imagine uh, that we have a nonlinear uh, a nonlinear function that generates uh, data. So we observe the data. We observe a large data set of input output, output observations, no? 
Uh, this data set, for some reason, uh, in a very general way, is split or partitioned into subsets, where every subset is sufficiently large to, to, to not be learned by uh, exact GP regression or classification. We have to use uh, approximate inference uh, models. In this case, uh, we use a sparse variational GPs, okay? And what would we do? What would we do? We, we, if, if every subset of data will be distributed across different teams, across different computers, across different whatever. Okay, we, we, we will have to consider local log marginal likelihood. So we, we, what we will do using a sparse variational GPS is, okay, I want to really do maximum likelihood. I, I, I have this local log marginal likelihood on every subset and independently, I do an elbow, I really build a, a lower bound on every log marginal likelihood and I fit my sparse variational GP that is characterized Let's assume that we have the, the, the simplest version, the, the, the initial one uh, in the literature with this uh, phi that are the variational parameters, this C that are the hyperparameters of the, or the, of the kernel and, and the inducing points and the location of the inducing points. We have this, these three subsets of, of parameters that define the model and we fit. So in the end, once we have finished and for every subset, we have really fitted uh, the log marginal, the, the, the lower bound, we have maximized, perform, uh, perform stochastic uh, learning, we, we, we obtain it. We, we have these three uh, subsets fitted. Uh, in, and indeed, what we are gonna do is we are gonna save this. We are gonna call this module that are the three elements that define our fitted model. Let's forget about the data. We are only interested on these three things. So how we assume that all the information all that we need are stored on them. Okay. So this is, again, regardless of the system, regardless of the time, we task uh, after task, could be on parallel, could be at different times, but we build this dictionary of modules. Every module being defined by uh, the elements that I have uh, that I have said. So, so now, if if really from these from these previous modules we want to build the the the, the, the final goal will be okay. N forget about the data. We only keep the modules, and we want now a GP, a new a sparse variational GP that is very well fitted as if we will have observed all the data together, but only observing the elements in this module. Okay, if we want that, we will expect the, the, the approximate uh, variational, the, the approximate posterior variational distribution to be at least equal or very close to the true posterior having observed all the data together. No. So the the the, the thing that uh, the, the the beauty of this um, is that we are gonna consider to, to really build uh, this new model from models, not from data. We are gonna first consider the global log marginal likelihood. We are gonna imagine, we uh, fantasize, as, as Henry said be, uh, before to me. We are gonna uh, imagine that we can observe the data, and we are gonna imagine that we can access to this log marginal likelihood. Okay, for doing that, um, we can use uh, these two strategies, uh, uh, also inspiring this work by Fran Ruiz, uh, augment and reduce, that is gonna like, okay, we are gonna imagine that there is exactly a nonlinear GP function that parameterize everything, no? Like, you, like a function, who has a lot of, of evaluations, really, really, really large dimensional, not infinite because otherwise um, will be will be problems. And indeed, there is a there is a paper which explores this that why you cannot really consider this infinite dimensional um, GP. I think is uh, from from Matthews and and some other colleges. 
And once we have these very, 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 very large uh, stochastic process, this uh, Gaussian process, we are going to reduce it only to the functions, to the valuations of interest using the properties of Gaussian marginals. Okay, so let's, let's define this uh, F plus as a function of dimensionality that contains all the function values taken at all the inputs, considering the whole data set, even if it is enormous, and also all the inducing points. Uh, we will see uh, why this is important later, because it's going to allow us to, to really eliminate or not consider uh, the locations of the data only in the, the inducing points. So let's try to, to, to build uh, a module Dry, a module-driven lower bound. So it's like a lower bound that is going to allow us to fit a new model, not considering data, only models. So first, okay, we say that we have this log marginal likelihood um, on the data that we, okay, we have here every subset of the output data, and we augment this as a joint distribution on a lot of function evaluations, no? F plus. Doing this, um, we also define this U star as the new, the, these are gonna be the, the, the function evaluations on the new inducing points located uh, at the new inducing points of this meta model that we are gonna build, this new model that we are interested to, to learn from, from the others. And uh, this is just factorization, it's nothing really, um, really, uh, we are here, and in the end, what we are gonna obtain is uh, this this bound, which is pretty straightforward. No, it's it's, the it's almost the classic one uh, that we have seen in sparse variational GPs with the the, the specific property that this function evaluate this function is very large. So this we have here this log likelihood where we can say that the conditioning over the data points, we, we, we can say that we are over conditioning over them. Okay. If we do that, um, we, we can factorize this, this, this likelihood term that this can be, if we are considering Gaussian regression is a Gaussian likelihood. If we are considering classification is Bernoulli, probably um, everyone in the audience, um, uh, knows more or less uh, what, what I'm referring with this density. Um, so if we can factorize this, this, and this is where the interesting point comes, is, okay, if we have this factorization across K, we have K terms of the, lo the log likelihood over every subset of data that for some reason we don't want to access because this term is what makes the learning process really, really uh, computationally um, expensive. So what we are going to do with the all modules is using the Bayes theorem and, and, and based in, 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 in this approximation that was already considered in, in the paper of Thambui and, and also Matthews uh, a few years ago, is to use these all models, this variational posterior, inverting the Bayes rule to really approximate the likelihood terms, okay? Um, if we do that, uh, we, we can see here in particularly that we have these distributions under the augmentation because our like, kind of a variational distribution over a lot of function, uh, functional points, but in the end, uh, both cancel and we only have our likelihood term approximated by this ratio between the variational posterior and the prior located on the inducing points. So if we substitute this in the, in the previous uh, bound, what we see is that we are obtaining a variational bound which does not revisit any data. In this bound, uh, here is the normalizing constant, in this bound, we really have this log ratio between the old posterior and the, and, the, and the already fitted prior. But there is no data in this one, but we have still a bound under the, 
or approximate bound under the log marginal likelihood where we have omitted the data, no? Um, also, okay, we- Sorry, can I, can, sorry, could you just remind me what the difference between uh, the mu k's and the mu stars are? Mu, where, where is mu? Uh, U, sorry, U, K. Uh, UK, yeah, exactly. Um, UK are the inducing, are the, the, the evaluation of the functions over the every, or, or the all inducing points. The inducing points that are already fitted. Those ones, this UK somehow, um, this distribution comes from this distribution here and the prior is generated from only from the information that we have stored previously in our dictionary of modules. And the U star is the new model that we are trying to fit. We are trying to fit a new sparse variational GP over the, the whole data set, but really not observing any old data, only using information from models. It's literally building this new star model, this new star sparse, as far as variational GP, not, not observing data, but only what is said by the, by the previous fitted models. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Okay. Um, so, and this bound is uh, exactly what, what Henry asked. We are gonna, again, because in the end it's the same type of model, again, fit this with respect to the variational, the uh, variational parameters, the hyperparameters, and the new inducing points. Okay. The the why the, the funny thing and, and this this way of really building this module module driven lower bounds is that you can really uh, use it with multi output GPS. We we you can really um, having like trained independent GPS on different tasks. You can learn do transfer learning and learn the correlation a posteriori. Really, you, you take the decision that your new meta model, for example, is gonna be a multi-output GP. And you do this substitution, this approximation of the likelihood terms using independent GPs. But you can now, your meta model can be a, a multi-output GP. I know, I know that this might, might uh, sound a bit weird, uh, but it's kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's a property that will be really nice. Even, even every one of the independent tasks that you are trying to connect post hoc to, to the learning can be heterogeneous. Like really you can have like a task that is regressing. You can really obtain, uh, do some classification because you have some data that is binary and even you can have new data in this figure. And a posteriori, using this new bound, you can build a multi-output model that learns from another, that really extracts. Because in the end, okay, you have always this, likelihood uh, approximation. So you are really not using the data and you are trying to contrast all the time your new model, whatever model is, whatever GP model is with uh, uh, the previously fitted ones. Okay. And yeah, in this case, the, the, the bound is, is pretty, pretty similar with the difference that here we have this, um, sorry for not really uh, redefining here the notation, but um, was yeah, it's to keep it a bit, uh, a bit clear. But here you have, instead of you, you have your V that are the, the latent functions that you have in a, in a variational sparse multi-output GP. But the mechanism is kind of the same. You are always contrasting, you are always looking to this uh, log radio that approximates, approximates the likelihood. No? Okay, mm. some results uh, that I wanted to, to show um, is this, for example, with this uh, GP regression, you can really uh, fit uh, very well. In this case, uh, we, this, this is the data in the lower row this is the, the data that we that we have is of course is synthetic. We split in we split it in five tasks. Uh, in the upper row, I only represent three of them, but okay, we, we fitted five. Uh, in this case, we see three, but we fitted five uh, GP models, sparse GP models, no, variationally and so on. And and this one over here, what uh, what is the, the ensemble GP or the meta model? has not revisited any data and it and, and also uh, 
the initialization has not been really uh, well located, but you can really uh, recover very well, or at least obtain uh, a fitting that is pretty close to what we would have obtained using having observed all the data. And yeah, we, we here compare uh, with previous models in the literature, particularly these uh, distributed ones from uh, Mark Jasonroth with uh, up to 1 million data points splitting in different tasks. Uh, here is difficult to compete uh, because they use, they use exact GP regression for the subsets and later for predicting, uh, they have this uh, approximation that is like a combination of all the regressors, no? But in the end, we kind of, of observe that this is going some, somewhere, no? Really, we, we are obtaining um, uh, a good fitting, a relatively really good fitting for not having uh, observed any data, only using uh, the uncertainty uh, kept in the models. Um, for classification, we did kind of a similar thing in, in this upper in upper part. Uh, we use this very well known uh, banana data set. Uh, in this case, we split it. Um, we split it the the data into four regions and for the four corners. Uh, and, and we had this GP really uh, this GP uh, class, uh, classification task a model really. Uh, fitting very well. And in the end, in the ensemble, we kind of obtained uh, a really good uh, classificator where also the, the new inducing points got very well locations without even having the data, only using the, the, the previous information. No? Um, I know probably you will ask me uh, later, we can discuss uh, what happened. In this case, you can see that all, all in these experiments, uh, I have split it, no? Like, the, the, the local models are not overlapping on the, on the input uh, area. And what happened if, that, if, if the models are overlapping? We, we, we will discuss before. I wanted to say for the previous regression results here, the, the task, uh, some tasks were overlapping and, and it still uh, works very well. Um, I will explain uh, why later. And, and, and this, in the end, was kind of, uh, this, this was also a bit more inspiring, this convolutional GPs. Uh, my, I really wanted to, to, to extend this to the convolutional GPs developed by Mar van der Wilk uh, and collaborators. Um, but OK, uh, maybe I, I didn't have uh, enough time, but uh, somehow we wanted to, to really uh, give the impression that with images will be super cool. You now, really, to have these sort of things where you can have local models on on the on the images, and later you can kind of combine or having this modularity. I think that is something that could be appreciated in the in the community. And um, yeah, and some some results on um, multi output regression, where I can I have to say that uh, results were. Good. Uh, we were obtaining good uh, good errors, but this combination of the modular GP from independent. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, we were having at least. I have here a kind of a different of the percentage of these minuses. How much? Uh, how much worse we were from using, for example, all the data. Uh, or, a, or fit in a, a multi-output GP observing the data. No? And you can see that is around 1%, 2%. Uh, this is, I think that these days, in this case, we were having, depends on, is different granularity. I think that here for months was, this experiment was a bit more difficult. But yeah, um, for multi-output GP, ah, for, this was for the US flight data set. Um, that was pretty, pretty, pretty large. Um, yeah. So more or less, um, these are the, the main results or the main ideas that uh, we presented in this modular Gaussian process paper uh, for transfer learning. So as, uh, as I said uh, to the organizer of the seminar, I, I also wanted to, to, to speak about this general idea and, and also say that uh, this thing of driving, uh, of building module uh, driven bounds or model model 
driven models, uh, models from models, is not only, I think, on this distributed uh, uh, scenario, but it's also very, very cool. And, 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 and we use the same kind of the same strategy for a streaming data. Okay, um, let's see if you can see the video. Um, in this case, uh, what we use is a, a sparse variational GP. So there are 1,000 iterations. Okay, so in every iteration, what we are doing is we are building a new model using only the previous model plus one observation. All the models are sparse variational GPs. And at every time step, we are observing uh, a new datum. And these uh, black dots that you see around are the, the inducing points that are continuously uh, relocating uh, to avoid forgetting. And, and that's kind of uh, what we wanted in, in this case, right? Uh, avoid this, this forgetting. Uh, for me, what is more surprising is that after uh, 1,000 iterations, 1,000 different models really ref um, is not refreshing. It's really a new model that does not observe any data, but observe a previous model. It's kind of crazy that after that, uh, we are still uh, um, uh, remembering what uh, what were the, the feeling. Here you can see that we have a bit of um, a, a bit of error because maybe the inducing points lost the position and of course the, the regularizing with respect to the data is no longer possible. So you you kind of it's, it's not perfect, but uh, it's going somewhere, no? So yeah. Um, can I ask a quick question? Sorry, another yeah. quick question about if you go back one slide. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, yeah, it was getting the fit was kind of getting worse as you added more and more points. Um, is there a way that you can add new inducing points in in your framework, or is there a way when you can decide when it'd be worth adding in? Yeah, yeah, more abso capacity? Exactly, absolutely. Um, this, this, I, I, I will explain later. But this um, continual GP paper, kind of the of the contribution, because this, I, this, this idea was first presented by Thambui in with his stream in sparse GPs. And in that case, the, the thing was that your inducing points could not be touched. Once you really learned your model, uh, you are kind of, you have your inducing points fixed. And so how you, you, you have to, to, to stick with that uh, and, and you cannot modify. But the thing that we introduced uh, was with this uh, augmentation, with this uh, thing of augmenting and reduce, is that you can really um, marginalize out that inducing points in a in a really efficient way and re um, yeah uh, reinitializing the number of inducing points. So yes, the 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 answer to your question is that you can choose at every iteration how which uh, how many inducing points you you want to have. But of course, the problem is that in, if in one iteration you choose to have a uh, uh, a few less, then you have forgotten forever. So that's kind of, of a trade-off uh, always here. I, I, there is, there, I think that there is a, a really nice combination of, of this, of this um, model uh, with this uh, paper from David Bart uh, on choosing what is for at every time step what is the the, the optimal number of using points that you need for really not forgetting. No, so. I don't know if I answered your question or, or, or I talked too much, but... Um, oh, that was great, thanks. Okay, nice. Um, and in a similar way as with the recyclable GPs, uh, this uh, works for multi-output GPs. And, and, and in, before, my, my, the, the, the general question was, okay, if I want a new model that whose approximation to the posterior should be as good as the posterior having observed all the data, now kind of we I, the, 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 the goal is to really keep having a variational posterior uh, that is close to the posterior if, I, if we will have observed all the data at every time step, but really not, uh, yeah, not, revisiting, the, not revisiting the data. Here the, the, the black, here, the black lines are the the inducing point locations. Um, 
yeah, and in this case, it differs a bit uh, on the notation with respect to the recyclable GPs, but the idea is the same. The idea is to really have in a module, in this case, so instead of having K modules uh, for different subsets, we only keep one module refreshed. No? So it's like, okay, uh, I observe a data point, I fit uh, my model, and I save my model, forget the data. In the next step, I got a new data and I use my old module, I train my new data, my, my new model, and so on and so on. And this is uh, what I what we did uh, for the previous figure. Um, yeah, I, I didn't want to 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 really get in, into into too much details here for not get boring, but what I can say is that the continual bound in this case, using uh, this augmentation and reduce, um, here ends up having this uh, this bound of over the log marginal livelihood of the stream of data. That is this continual bound that has four terms that are that are pretty um, pretty intuitive, I would say. No, so you have uh, the first term. This first term is the expectation. Okay, you have. What is the expectation of my new posterior, of my new model over the new data fitted? Okay, you always have to, to maximize the expectation with res respect to your new data point. But interestingly, there are these other uh, three uh, KL regularizers uh, with, with uh, I, I, I used to call this like kind of the sandwich regular, regularization. Uh, there is, there is, uh, um, some other details that maybe we, we can discuss here, but um, you have a first regularizer that is really saying to you like, hey, your new posterior is regularized by your new prior. Nice. Um, but also take care because your new uh, variational posterior is also regularized by your old GP posterior. No? So it's uh, on one side you are regularized uh, by your new prior beliefs, but also take care because you had uh, something before. And in the end, you also have this other regularizer that kind of says, that measures the discrepancy between your new, um, new variational posterior over the new inducing points and what the old posterior says over your new inducing points. So... Um, yeah, the, this paper is still a uh, work in progress, um, so, but you can find uh, a lot of details, it's quite, it's, uh, quite long uh, with uh, a, bit, <laughs> a bit of too much in this continual multitask Gaussian process uh, in archive. So check out it if you, or we can, or reach me if you are interested in this. And yeah, these are also the main references uh, for the talk. Um, uh, my collaborators, these two words, these two pieces of work were the result when I was visiting in, in Sheffield uh, some years ago and also uh, in collaboration with my, my old PhD supervisor, Antonio, and Mauricio, of course, who was my supervisor in, uh, in Sheffield at that time and he's in Manchester now. So, yeah, um, I'm open for questions and thank you very much uh, for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for that, Pablo. That was excellent. Um, I'm sure we have some questions. Um, does anyone anyone have anything I, to say? Yeah, I have a question. Um, it, so the in the in the in the previous to last slide that you showed, you had you had this uh, likelihood term and then three what you call regularizer terms. But I was concerned about the sign. Yeah, like so the two of them are negative, and I'm, I'm happy calling them regularizers, but they but the middle term has a positive sign. So the bigger the distance, the, the higher the, the better the model, right? Yeah, 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 yeah you're right. I, I uh, also, when, when I derived this the first time, uh, I was kind of surprised. Um, there is, I, I don't remember the paper. There is a paper of Frank Reed that something happened very similar to him, that he has this kind of sandwich uh, between the, the two KLs. Um, I, I, I think yeah. you're right. I think that it makes sense because it only makes sense as a pair with the other, yeah, with the exactly. other regularizer. And exactly. so I, I can't, uh, I can't 
try and work it out on the fly, but I think I think mm. it does correspond to a bound altogether. Exactly. When you separate out the, the terms uh, this way. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Indeed, it was the same. Uh, there was some condition over there. To Frank Ruiz in his paper with Michalis, uh, they also happened that they have this sandwich with two KLs, one with the reversed sign, and somehow the it enforces to really uh, explore, not to trying to reach, because we can say that if the KL is in the other sign, is kind of enforcing. Um, I, I don't know now. So the minus, of course, is trying to keep you uh, most closely to the other, but the other uh, with the other term is repelling. No, so yeah, exactly. So both both together plays plays the role. Um, yeah, and it's and it's all together. It's a still a lower bound. Yeah, yeah, presumably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. So, so in these examples we've looked at, I mean, maybe it's just you've chosen these so we can visualize them, but it's all been kind of time series based, right? Like the data is coming from the right. Mm -hmm. are, are there any reasons why you can't use your framework for just kind of general data coming in, kind of kind of in any place, or or, or does it really kind of benefit in? Ah, uh, like, yeah. You, you mean like a wave passing? Yeah. I don't think so. Indeed, uh, I think that you. Yeah, exactly. I I, I did an, I think in the paper I tried in the first draft I did an experiment kind of imagine like a, a cloud of points really whose density begins to be more and more dense and I think that it could it indeed I think that it will work better because I think that the problem is a bit well I wouldn't say simpler but at least um, yeah at least you are always placing the points over the input areas that you already have modeled. Here, the, I, the problem is difficult when you have this wave of points because you have a new point on a region of the input space which has been not explored. So you have to really shift during, or the, you, you, you are expecting the inducing points to shift to that area to try to explain. No? So somehow they, they, it's a bit more complex, but yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So like the model fitting might be Mm -hmm. slightly easier but so let, well let's talk base up then like this would be mm -hmm. kind of perfect for a yeah. kind of a, a base up setting where, where we can't you know model all the data mm -hmm. um have you done any experiments uh, on what on, like, on, using using this continual gas process as a surrogate model for Bayesian optimization no not yet not yet i have to say that i, I this was kind of the end of, of my thesis uh, project, and I didn't have time for really digging into Bayesian optimization at that time. Um, I, I have another question. So in, on one of the, in one of the tables, you referred to the Bayesian committee machine. Uh, mm -hmm. I, and so I'm wondering, is there a tighter relationship to the Bayesian committee machine? I know that that's not within the variational framework, but if I remember correctly, the Bayesian committee machine you kind of divide the data and then you model the data individually and then you combine them again. But then there's this little thing in the Bayesian community machine that you sort of, you've counted the prior. If you if you combine 10 models and you've com then you've used the prior 10 times and then you divide out the, the prior nine times to, to end up with just one likelihood from every data point plus one times the prior. Is there a similar effect that you have to do or does that does that come out in the wash in the variational framework? Sorry, there's a very complicated question. If you don't, no, 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 no. I mean, I, I I got you absolutely. I mean, I'm trying to remember because in the uh, this this Bayesian committee machines, I took all these uh, baselines from the paper of Mar Deisenroth, and he had a, a in his paper there is a a great discussion on this. Mm, I think that uh, at some point I realized that. Our framework with this modular GPs was exactly the same thing that they were considering uh, for this regression, but in the variational, in the variational uh, sparse variational GP framework. Um, I don't remember now this thing with the with the na with having ten and and then nine. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yep, sorry for not.
A quick curiosity question about implementation. Mm -hmm. Is this available somewhere? Yeah. Do you use a beloved GP flow or do you use something else? Yeah. Um, I, I, I was also saying to Henry before, um, yeah, I couldn't manage at the beginning. I tried to do with GP flow. I, for some reasons, I want to prototype quite fast. Uh, so I couldn't really uh, manage with, but I, everything is on PyTorch. Um, so I'm trying to refactor it in a very general way. I think that I will have it uh, very soon. Uh, there is a version for public use that you can pick. And I don't know if it's exactly because I are kind of the experiments from the conference, uh, particularly on this modular GP. Um, so it's not really a plug and play code right now, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, you you really can uh, you can um, ping me uh, if you want uh, an, an implementation, and let's see if we can maybe also put in GP flow or do something over there. Right. Thank you. Hmm. Both both models, both the, the, the modular one and the continual, uh, both uh, are in PyTorch as well. Um, yeah. yeah, it'd be certain, certainly be interesting to try some of this stuff. Yeah. Um, so our Python, our base up library is called Trieste. Um, and we kind of, yeah, we, we've got a lot of stuff in there with sparse GPs for basic optimization, but we haven't kind of tried anything along these lines, kind of incrementally updating models and, and things. So there's definitely some scope here. Um, but yeah, as I said before the call, I'll get in touch in a, a week or so and we'll have a proper chat about it. So I'm just just trying to work out what the what the computational cost of this is versus just SVGP on the the full data set because it's still got the n cubed uh, term for the number of music points in the model, right? But you just have it's going to scale with the number of inducing points of your sub models rather than the number of data points for the for the other term. Right? Exactly, exactly. is is extremely fast uh, because in the end, you I mean, of course, depend it depends on the number of inducing points that you have in the local models. Um, but yeah, um, exactly. It scales very, very well because somehow you have the control. You have absolutely no longer uh, this problem of the dependence on the number of, uh, of inducing points, oh, sorry, of observations, but you really have the full control of the number of the, comp of the computational cost of the, of the model. So yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of nice in that, in that part. And also, um, I, I, I forgot to say this, but um, the, the model itself is very robust. Even imagine if you have different models that they are saying different things. And you could say to me, hey, and then how what's, uh, what's the final result? No? And, but the nice thing is that here you have this expectation over the log ratio. So in the end, you are kind of fitting to, a, to an average solution over all the previous pre-trained models. And, and that's very nice in the end and, and, and really robust to, if for example, um, in this Bayesian committee machine or the, 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 what the other models that we commented, this final predictive equation is literally a combination of the others. If one is, is bad fitted or is a disaster one of the models, the predictive is gonna be a disaster probably. Or, or at least is going to have some some issues in this in this problem. If one of the models for some reason didn't convert or is a disaster, you can still get some res some good results. Yeah. So it's kind of robust in that sense because it's working on the expectation uh, side. I could have missed something, but what sort of quantity of these global inducing inputs do you need? So, so you were talking about how how you can keep relatively few of the kind of the intuition points which correspond to the local models. But then you do also have this global Z star on this on this thing here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, because I mean you have these global ones. Of course, uh, you I mean you can decide if you want to have a few ones or or have 
a larger numbers, but uh, in the end is kind of, you are fitting a new variational GP model with new inducing points that you decide how, how, um, how many do you want and you are learning them from the inducing points on the locals. And so you have the, the UK are the, the, the local inducing points that are already well positioned and then you have these new, uh, these new global ones that, yeah, in this, uh, in this figure, for example, the, glo uh, yeah, the global ones will be uh, these ones over here. These ones over here. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. 